let's uh, let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we uh, we thank you that you have chosen us uh, to be your people, uh, exiles in this world, but headed for our our true home, headed for heaven. And uh, we pray now that you would help us to to know how you want us to live as as your holy people in this world. Uh, help us to be persevering um, through the suffering as we look forward to glory and help us to be uh, distinctively different from those around us. We pray that you help me to be teaching your word uh, faithfully and uh, and clearly. And uh, we pray that you would uh, grant us the uh, concentration uh, this evening, that we would uh, gain much from your words and that it would be uh, your word would be at work uh, in our lives, uh, producing um, the fruit you desire. So we commit this time to you in Jesus name. Amen. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, we're looking at one and uh, two uh, Peter today, and then also the book of of Jude. And I guess the thing that we know about the book of one uh, Peter is it's it's a book that encourages us through times of suffering. Uh, I think if you've been a Christian for any uh, period of time, you will know uh, that the Christian life is is hard. Right? There are many. Uh, difficulties that we face uh, along the way and uh and it can be hard to to keep to keep going uh in the christian uh life uh sometimes of course we we suffer just because of the uh just because we live in a fallen world uh and so we suffer things like uh, persecution or i mean we suffer things like sickness or uh uh, or we lose our loved ones. Uh, we uh, we maybe we get ang anxious about things. Um, you know, we face uh, pandemics and 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 all these these things. Sometimes we uh, we suffer from the sins of other people. Um, sometimes we suffer from our own sins and the bad decisions um, that we make. Uh, and, and sometimes we, we we suffer for following Jesus too, isn't it? We we suffer because uh, we are we face opposition for our faith. Uh, maybe uh, opposition from the authorities or opposition from our family um, or, or from those around us. And, uh, and that can take different forms. It, it may be uh, marginalization, maybe discrimination, maybe mocking, uh, or maybe even more uh, severe forms of, of persecution. And, uh, and so it, it's, it's normal that we face uh, suffering in the Christian life. And, and it's those times that uh, we're going to be put to our faith is going to be put to the test. You know, is our faith uh, real? Um, are we, you know, are we going to persevere, or we're we just going to give up uh, when uh, when it all uh, gets difficult? So, what's going to keep us going in the Christian life? Uh, what's going to help us keep living differently as Christians, even though it's hard and difficult? Well, that's uh, where this uh, this letter uh, fits in the book of of one, one Peter. It's a, it's a gem in the New Testament because it especially deals uh, with uh, suffering Christians. It's not alone in that. Of course, James, uh, James we looked at last time, is, is writing to suffering Christians too. But um, this is a, is a really helpful uh, one uh, for, uh, to encourage us uh, in our suffering. Well, let's, uh, let's look at the uh, background issues and then we'll come back to uh, the contents of, uh, of the letter. And uh, in terms of the uh, the authorship, of course, uh, uh, the, the letter claims to be written by the Apostle Peter. The first verse says, uh, Peter, uh, an apostle uh, of Jesus Christ. Uh, and as we come across to, to chapter five, uh, we see that he describes himself as a, a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings. And so... Uh, the author claims to be an, uh, an eyewitness, and uh, there are certain similarities between the book of 1 Peter and the recorded words of Peter in the, in the Gospels, uh, and, and that also suggests that it's, it's written uh, by the Apostle uh, Peter himself. Uh, now, uh, we are told that uh, Peter used a, a scribe um, in, in writing the letter, so if we came across to chapter 5, uh, we see this chapter 5 and it is uh, verse uh, 12 it says by Silvanus a faithful brother as I regard him I have written to you briefly exhorting and declaring to you that this is the true grace of God 
stand firm in it. Uh, so we've seen that it, it was uh, quite a common practice uh, for the apostles to use scribes in, in uh, writing their letters. And here it, it's, it's stated um, that, uh, that Silvanus is actually penning, uh, penning the letter. Uh, now, uh, it's, it was almost undisputed in the early church that, uh, that Peter was, uh, the, uh, was the author. Um, uh, a guy called Michaels, he, he concludes this, aside from the four Gospels uh, and the letters of Paul, the external attestation for one Peter is as strong or stronger uh, than that of any New Testament uh, book. Uh, in other words, we're quite, uh, you know, we're quite certain um, that uh, Peter wrote the book, right? But, um, of course, as we've seen throughout this course, there are various uh, modern uh, scholars who would uh, question that and, and argue that, uh, it, that it wasn't written um, by, by Peter. There's various reasons they give for this. Uh, first, it's suggested that, uh, you know, Peter is addressing a kind of empire-wide persecution that uh, must have only happened after Peter's death, and so Peter couldn't have written it. Uh, and secondly, it, it said that Peter uh, would, have, would not have been familiar with Paul's epistles in his lifetime, uh, and so on. But, you know, we'll see in a moment, actually, both of those, both of those theories is actually uh, flawed. There are other reasons that people have argued. They say that uh, Paul would have mentioned Peter uh, in Romans if, if uh, Peter was really in Rome. Uh, we'll see. Uh, we, we see at the end of the letter that that's where uh, Peter is is uh, writing from. Let me just share the screen. Uh, so at the end part here, he says, uh, "She who is in Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings. So does Mark, my son." And when he says, "She who is in Babylon," this is most likely a you know a cipher or code for him being um, being in Rome uh, and writing from Rome. So I said, "Well, if." Uh, if he was really in Rome, then Paul would have mentioned him in Romans. Um, uh, people say uh, people say that uh, Peter couldn't have evangelized uh, Gentile areas where Paul did his work because didn't they agree on that in the book of Galatians? Or they say, uh, look, the church structure in chapter five where it talks about elders must have been after Peter's death. Or they say, well, if it was really written by Peter, he would have had more personal stories uh, about uh, about Jesus in uh, in 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 the letter and so on. So there are all these uh, various uh, uh, objections, and some of these we have encountered um, before. Some say one Peter is too Pauline uh, to be written by Peter, uh, or or sometimes people say he's he wouldn't have quoted from the uh, Greek old uh, the Greek Old Testament uh, if uh, he was if Peter was really writing. He would have used the Masoretic text, the Hebrew text. Uh, or they say if it was written by Peter, he wouldn't be so competent in Greek. The Greek wouldn't be so uh, wonderful as it is here, right? Uh, and uh, for all these reasons, people uh, argue that, well, maybe the letter was uh, pseudonymous. But uh, you can see how some of those, uh, many of those arguments are very, uh, are very weak. I mean, for starters, he is, uh, uh, it, it wouldn't be surprising that the Greek is good if he's using a scribe. You know, maybe Silvanus is, you know, is rather good at, at, at writing, uh, and, and and so that's why his 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 Greek uh, is, is is quite good. Uh, if he's writing to, you know, uh, Christians in Gentile areas, uh, which we're going to argue for, then of course it's not surprising that he would use the, you know, the Greek old the Greek Old Testament um, when he's uh, when he's quoting it. Uh, we, we've seen earlier in the, the argument regarding uh, church structures and elders and deacons and all that, but that actually happened quite earlier. We, we've seen that mentioned in Philippians already, um, so that's not a problem. Uh, people say, well, you would have had more personal stories, or when we get to 2 Peter, we'll see that there are some personal stories um, there and so on. So all these arguments, they're not really very, uh, they're not really very good ones. Uh, as for the argument about the persecution, I say, well, you know, Peter is talking about a time where there seems to be widespread persecution. Well, it's it's not necessarily the case. Uh, uh, he may be looking forward to more serious persecution to come. It seems more like the kind of persecution they're facing uh, in uh, at the moment is kind of marginalization, discrimination, mocking, um, these kinds of things. Not so much being fed to the lines yet, although it's it seems like Peter sees that coming. He talks about fiery trials uh, that are. Uh, 
uh, that are on the way. So there's no reason uh, really to question um, uh, that Peter wrote it. Uh, and that, as I said, that was the, the consensus of pretty much everyone in, in, in the early church. Uh, so uh, I, Howard Marshall, he's a New Testament scholar we've met various times. He says this, if there was ever a weak case for pseudonymity, surely it is with respect to this letter. So in other words, the arguments against Peter writing it are pretty much the weakest for any, any letter in, in the New Testament. Okay, so uh, so it's written by written by Paul. Uh, where is he writing it from? I mean, it's write, written by Peter. Where is he writing it from? We've said he's he's writing it from uh, from Rome. Uh, we saw in chapter five, verse thirteen, he mentions she who is in Babylon, uh, and uh, and that suggests that he's that, that she's writing from Rome. The she there is probably referring to the church, right? Because the Greek word for church, ecclesia, is a feminine word, and so you, we usually talk about churches as as, as she. Um, and uh, and if that's the case, uh, if Peter wrote it, he wrote it from from Rome, then it's probably around maybe 62, 63 AD uh, after Paul's already left Rome. Uh, a date after that is pretty unlikely because Peter was killed, um, as the tradition says, about 62 to 65 AD, and he still needs to write to Peter after this letter. Um, so there needs to be some time for that to happen. So we're looking at probably early 60s writing one peter from uh, from rome itself so who is he writing to that's the that's the next question that we come to and uh he he tells us the audience in the first verse of course let me share my screen here uh, so the letter is addressed to to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion uh in pontus galatia cappadocia asia and Bithynia, right? So you can uh, you can see those places mentioned here: Asia, Bithynia, Pontus, Cappadocia, uh, Galatia. So he's 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 writing in this area. Um, they most likely uh, refer to uh, to Roman provinces uh, and, and so on. So the mention of uh, now he mentions the dispersion here, right? The elect exiles of the dispersion. Uh, and so for some, that's taken to suggest a, uh, a Jewish audience, right? Uh, Jewish people that have been uh, scattered throughout uh, the Roman Empire. Uh, we saw uh, in when we we're looking at James last week that, that, that James is, is writing to the dispersion too. Uh, and we saw that in the case of James, it's very likely that he is writing to um, to, to, to Jewish Christians. And we saw that was because he's writing quite early. Um, you know, James was the head of the, the church in Jerusalem and so on and so forth. So the arguments seem to be quite strong for James writing to Jewish Christians. But we'll see here that it's actually much more likely that in the case of Peter, he's actually writing to Gentile Christians. Uh, and, and he's using this language of, uh, of the dispersion uh, in a theological sense or a, a metaphorical uh, a meta metaphorical ways. So uh, he calls his readers elect exiles, elect exiles. Uh, so his readers are elect. Uh, that is a, 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 was a very common description of Israel uh, in, uh, in the Old Testament. Right? Uh, and uh, so in that way, uh, God's people are being described here, the, 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 the church that he's, or the Christians he's writing to, they're being described as like the new Israel or the new uh, people of God. So you remember uh, God chose Abraham uh, and he, you know, he left his home and he journeyed to the promised land. And then, uh, you know, later his descendants became the nation of Israel and, and they too were, uh, were were exiles, you know, they were away from their true home, they wandered through the promised land, and eventually they came uh, to, uh, they, they came to the promised land, they were elect exiles, elect means that they were God's chosen, special people, Exodus 19, uh, you know, you are to me, a, 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 my treasured possession, out of all the, all the world, so they're elect, and they're exiles, exiles in the sense that they are away from their true home they are like refugees they are like uh, they are like uh, sojourners uh, headed to their true home but not uh, but not yet uh, arrived yet right? uh, 
Uh, we might say that they, uh, uh, they're a little bit like uh, expats, right? Or they're like uh, international students or they're like uh, foreign, uh, foreign workers, right? They're away from their, uh, from their true home, yeah? And, uh, and so it's, in, in this sense, uh, what we see Peter doing in this letter is he's, he's drawing a, a, a parallel between Israel's story in the Old Testament and the church's story uh, in the New Testament, right? So Israel, they were God's chosen people, but they were away from their true home. Uh, and that meant that they suffered, you know, they, they, they suffered at the hands of, of, of Pharaoh. They, uh, you know, they had to go through, uh, through, the, through the wilderness where there were various trials and temptations and, and so on. And, but they, they, they were suffering now, but looking forward to glory, looking forward to entering into um, the, the, the promised land that, that, that God had promised. And, 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 and we'll see that that's basically what, uh, what Peter is saying here too. Like we, we are God's chosen people, right? Uh, and you know, set apart, especially to be His, but we're away from our true home. You know, not the not the not the land of Israel, not the physical, uh, you know, physical nation state of Israel today. But we're away from our true home. We're we're away from heaven itself. We're we're journeying there, but we haven't arrived yet. And as we journey, we're uh, you, you know, we're, we, we're strangers here. We, 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 we stand out and there's, there's suffering and there's, there's difficulty at suffering now, but we're looking forward to, um, to, to, to glory um, to come. Yeah. Uh, and, and so there are various uh, descriptions that we have in the letter that suggest to us that we are indeed looking at a, uh, a Gentile audience. Let's have a look at a couple of those together. So chapter one, verse 14. Chapter one, verse 14. It says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. And former ignorance there, that, that seems like a strange way of talking about uh, Jews. Right? Or chapter 1, verse 18. Uh, knowing that you are ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold. Or chapter 2 and verse uh, 10. Uh, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, uh, now you have received mercy. And perhaps the clinches, chapter 4 and verse 3, the time is that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and, uh, and, and lawless idolatry. So all these all these uh, descriptions, uh, they suggest that uh, he is, in fact, writing to people who uh, come from a Gentile uh, Gentile background. Of course, it doesn't mean that there couldn't have been some, some Jews addressed as well, uh, but they seem to be more of a, of, a, of a Gentile background. Okay, so Peter the Apostle, uh, he is writing to, uh, from Rome uh, to uh, Gentile Christians uh, who are away from their true home and uh, and, and headed on to to heaven. Uh, so the next the next question we come to then is what is the purpose? You know what is why why is Peter writing the letter? And uh, remember this is always the key question to us, right? Whenever you come to the New Testament letters, is what what's the author's intention? Right? And I think it's there's, there's, there's little doubt here that uh, Peter is writing this to encourage suffering Christians. Peter is writing this to in, to encourage suffering Christians. Uh, the theme of suffering actually dominates the book. Uh, the, you know, the word for suffering occurs twelve times in the book. Uh, it, it only occurs eleven times in the rest of the New Testament. Right, so we've got twelve occurrences in one book 11 in the rest of the new testament put together combined uh it shows that it's actually a, a, a big theme uh peter opens the letter talking about all kinds of trials um he ends the letter with an encouragement to stand firm in god's grace despite the the the, the suffering that they have to face let's look at a couple of verses here so chapter one and uh and verse uh, six 
He says, in this you rejoice, right? Your heavenly inheritance. In this you rejoice, though for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. And then chapter 5 and verse 10, uh, he says, after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you to him. Be the glory uh, forever uh, and ever. I mean, he talks about the sufferings of Christ. He talks about a uh, suffering for Christ. Uh, so, uh, you know, in chapter uh, chapter one, uh, chapter three, right, he, he, he talks about uh, it's better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Christ also uh, suffered uh, for, for sins. Uh, but, but as I mentioned, it, most scholars think he's not kind of, he's, he's not writing during the you know, kind of empire-wide persecution that would come later, especially with Nero. Uh, is, Nero was around the, the 64 AD, uh, or a Domitian was in the late 90s, or Trajan. So there were several times where the Roman emperors uh, were uh, brutal uh, towards uh, and systematic in persecuting uh, uh, the Christians. So it doesn't it doesn't seem to be that yet. I mean, it might be moving towards that, but it seems more like uh, things like mocking, verbal abuse, discrimination, um, uh, etc. Uh, and and we see Peter's purpose comes out uh, at the end there. Uh, I think he states his purpose in chapter 5 and verse 12. So let's have a look at that, chapter 5 and verse 12. He says, By Silvanus, faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it right uh so now peter in 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 that in that verse he's he's clearly referring back to what he's just said in the previous verses right in the previous verses he's talked about how after you've suffered a, a little while god will bring you bring you to glory he himself will restore confirm and strengthen you so they say look this is the true grace of god suffering now but glory uh glory later yeah and and so Peter's goal in writing this this letter is to help us understand that suffering is the norm in the Christian life, and we need to persevere through suffering now, looking forward to uh, glory later on. I mean, these days uh, we still very commonly uh, uh, encounter various forms of prosperity teaching. I'm sure you're familiar with prosperity teaching. And uh, prosperity teaching essentially says, look, if you have enough faith in Jesus, then God's going to bless you. Right? And the blessings are various material blessings. It's going to make you rich. It's going to make you successful in your career. It's going to um, you know, heal you of all your sicknesses and, and, and all of these things. Right? And for someone preaching prosperity teaching, there's no place for suffering in the Christian life. You know, the Christian life should not never be one of suffering. It should never be one of difficulty. It should be one of victory it should be one of prosperity and, and and so on but you see what peter's saying here this is the true grace of god stand firm in it this is the the true pattern for the christian life suffering now glory later and that shouldn't surprise us of course because that's what the shape of jesus life was jesus came into the world suffering crucifixion and then you know resurrection and glory suffering now glory later that's how it worked for jesus uh, and 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 that's how it's going to work for us now cruden po points us to another verse that uh, is a good candidate for a purpose statement uh, in in the letter and that's chapter 4 and verse 19 chapter 4 and verse 19 and that verse says therefore let those who suffer according to god's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while continuing to do to do good okay. uh, and the helpful thing about that, uh, that that statement there you see is that uh yeah it's got the, the it's got the suffering now trusting god in your suffering looking forward to glory later uh but the other aspect it brings out here is the idea of continuing to do uh, to do good 
Um, that is, even as we live our Christian life of suffering now and, and, and glory later, what we need to do is to, to continue to be obedient, uh, to, to continue to be godly, to continue to do good. Because, of course, many times in the Christian life, we suffer precisely because of the good things that you that you do. I mean, just imagine that you are in your workplace and, um, you know, you say to your colleagues, I'm sorry, I, I can't stay back and help on this project because I need to go to Bible study tonight. Um, uh, well, I imagine that's going to irritate quite a few of your, you know, your, your colleagues who think that you should be there helping them with the work or, 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 or say, uh, you know, your boss says to you that, uh, he wants you to, uh, you know, uh, Kind of deceive the client in some way to slip in a few clauses or to, to promise something that you're never going to give or something like that or just change the numbers a bit to uh, you know make them uh, you know look a, a, a bit nicer and you as a christian say no i'm i'm not doing that i'm going to be honest i'm going to do it truthfully well you're going to suffer aren't you your, your, your boss is going to be upset with you for doing that um and and then who knows what might uh, come as as a result of that right so very often in the christian life we suffer precisely because we do good because we're we're different and and as we live godly lives it exposes the the wickedness of the people around us and they don't like that um uh, and 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 so on so uh so another another commentator mcclay he says that peter has the clear aim of helping embattled christians keep following christ all the way um, to to glory you can see there's there's quite a lot of agreement here uh it's it's written to encourage suffering christians and help them to be godly as they wait for uh for, for glory to come um now even though that's the case right and and that's probably the primary theme of peter suffering now glory later keep going this is the true grace of god that's probably the primary theme but at the same time people have noticed that there's lots and lots of encouragements towards holy living right? uh, so much so that sometimes people think well actually maybe that's peter's main purpose he he, he wants to encourage us to live uh you know holy lives in uh in in every in, in every aspect um and and I, I don't think that's right i don't think that is the main theme of the letter i think it's suffering before glory i think that's the main theme but the, the emphasis on holiness is definitely there you 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 can't uh, you can't miss it right um and so what we need to do is we need to understand those appeals for holiness um in light of the you know the the, the greater aim of of suffering to glory and we see how okay just as as god's people in the old testament were called to be his holy people on their you know journey to the promised land so uh, we are to do we are to do the same thing as uh, as well um, other people will notice the way that Peter is addressing his readers as God's new worshipping community. Right? Um, in other words, uh, there are, he seems to be presenting uh, the, the Gentile church here as the true Israel or the fulfillment of everything that Israel stood for. Let me just maybe give one example of, of, of this so you can see where it comes from. Uh, so let's have a look at uh, chapter two. And in the previous uh, previous verses, it talks about those who who stumbled, um, who disobeyed the word as they, uh, you know, as they were destined to. Yeah. Um, and we, you, we meet we meet these uh, these verses in the Gospels too. Jesus quotes these verses to the Pharisees and and, and so on. Um, and then they get very upset about it. Uh, so the Jews, they stumble over Jesus, the stumbling block, they crucify him. And, and, and Peter says, as they were destined to. And then he continues here in verse 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, now you are God's people. Once you'd not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And, and it's impossible to not pick up there the allusions to the Old Testament. 
because these were very important descriptions of Israel and Israel's mission uh, in the Old Testament. So if we think of uh, the Exodus chapter 19, right? and in Exodus uh, chapter 19, uh, Israel has just come to Mount Sinai, uh, and, and Moses calls up on the mountain, God addresses him. He says, thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you'll indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. Uh, so you can see there how Israel is being described as God's special chosen people, right? Of course, the whole earth is God's. God created it, so all the nations belong to him. Uh, but God's pointing out here that uh, God chose Israel to be his special people. You know, God had made those promises to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, right? Uh, he promised him fame, land, offspring, blessing, He'd make his name great, He'd bring them to the promised land, He'd multiply their descendants into a great nation, and, and, and he blessed them, and all the nations would be blessed uh, through him. And it's those promises that are being picked up here in, in, in Exodus chapter 19. That they, Israel is the descendants of Abraham, God's specially chosen people, the people through whom he would bring blessing to the world. And you notice how they're described there. They're described as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. What's a priest? A priest is someone who represents God to people and people to God. They are the mediator. They are the intermediary, um, etc. But notice how the whole nation of Israel is described as that. Right? They are a kingdom of priests right? they are a holy nation so what's going on here who are they who are they representing god to you see that the, the mission of israel in the old testament was that they were to be his special people his holy people distinct from all the nations around them as they followed god's law and so on for the purpose of making him known to the other nations right so as the nations came to, to Israel and heard their law, etc., they, they, they would come to know God. You see, that was their mission, right? They were to be God's holy people, his, his, his priests in this world, with the job of making him known to the world. But, of course, they failed at the mission. They failed terribly. Right? Instead of uh, being a holy people, they became an idolatrous people. Uh, and instead of making God known among the nations, they blasphemed his name uh, uh, among, the, among the nations to the, to the extent that even when uh, God finally sent his Messiah to his people, instead of welcoming him, they killed him. Yeah? Uh, and so as we come now to, to Peter, we see how Peter is transferring all those, the, those titles and that mission from Old Testament Israel now to uh, to the church let's go back to peter and he says but you are a chosen race you are a royal priesthood right or a kingdom of priests you are a holy nation a people who for his own possession and notice it's the same mission right that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous uh light right so uh we see uh, God's people here being presented as God's new worshipping community. And, and I guess that's why he starts the way he does, isn't it? To the, to the elect exiles of the dispersion. Because that's, that's who Israel was. They were God's elect chosen people. That's who Israel was. They were sojourners on a journey to their promised land. Uh, but now it's not Israel being described. It's the church that is being described. The church is God's new worshipping community the new people of god the true israel that fulfills all that israel was meant to be but wasn't right uh, so people notice this right and and they point out well maybe that maybe that is a big theme of 
of, of, of why you know why Peter is writing this. But I think I hope you can see that even that right as that, that's certainly there it's certainly a big thing that the peter's doing but even then that's really serving the the greater goal of encouraging suffering christians right because he, he's presenting them as god's you know god's chosen special people uh like old testament israel fulfilling old testament israel in order to encourage them to persevere to glory you know just like israel was on their journey to the promised land so god's church is on its journey to, to to heaven and so understanding that you know they are god's new worshiping community encourages them uh to 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 press on right uh so okay so you can see that's the main theme uh but there are these uh, other other themes that go with it holiness godly con godly conduct and uh, the idea of God's people as the, the, the new worshiping community. Those those are sort of major themes that are supporting the um, the bigger purpose uh, that that Peter has. Now we might ask the next question. We might ask is how does Peter achieve this goal? Right? How does Peter actually encourages his readers to persevere um, through suffering? Uh, and uh, the first the first way that he encourages them. Uh, is is basically by helping them to look forward to glory. Right? The suffering now is temporary, but there is eternal glory uh, to come. Let's just look at a couple of places where we see that. Uh, so at the start, chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be received, re ready to be revealed in the last time. Right? So he, he opens with the, the great hope that we have, the living hope that we have, uh, founded upon the resurrection of jesus jesus died but he was risen he ascended to the throne of of, of, of heaven and, and so now we look we too look forward to a heavenly inheritance uh that is a place uh in 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 god's presence uh, with him uh again uh, the old testament context is helpful for us here uh in the book of deuteronomy especially god promised israel an inheritance uh, what was the inheritance that God promised them in in Deuteronomy? Well, it was the promised land. Right? Uh, God was going to give Israel the promised land as their in, inheritance. And so in the same way, we have an inheritance. Uh, what's that inheritance? Well, ultimately, that, that inheritance that we have is, is, is heaven. Um, and because we have this hope therefore we can persevere through suffering now so he continues in verse six in this you rejoice right your heavenly hope in this you rejoice though now for a little while if necessary you've been grieved by various trials so that the genuine tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes that's tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you've not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with hope that is inex inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls, right? So you, you press on towards glory um, and that helps you to go through the sufferings now. Uh, that's the hope uh, that is to come. And we see this scattered many times throughout the letter. Uh, if we go to the end, uh, to chapter 5, uh, Peter says, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that's going to be revealed. See, there's suffering now, but glory later. Or again in verse 10, after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace has called you to his eternal glory in, in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. See, suffering first, uh, glory uh, coming uh, later. 
uh, chapter four, verse 13, you see a similar thing. Uh, he says, uh, don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings so that you also may be glad, when, uh, rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Right? You see how, I'm sure you can see how it works, right? It's suffering now, but we can press on through the suffering because there is glory to come. We have a sure and, and secure hope. Um, and that means that we can even rejoice in our sufferings now because we know um, what, uh, what is ahead. So that's the first way that he encourages them to go through suffering is to look forward to their hope, the hope of glory. And then the second way he encourages them to uh, to persevere through their sufferings is to look to Jesus, okay? to point to the example of Christ. Um, uh, his example, both of godliness in suffering uh, and, uh, of course, his example of, uh, of suffering before glory. Let's just look at one example here uh, from uh, maybe from chapter two. Uh, so let me share the screen here. Uh, and let's pick it up from verse 18. Now you can see he's addressing slaves here. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. This is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. What credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God, right? Uh, and so the encouragement there is to endure unjust suffering. You do good as a Christian, you expect that suffering will result and then you endure it. But how do you endure it? Verse 21, for to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was there deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. He continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Notice that phrase, how closely um, that, uh, that, that resembles chapter 4 and verse 19 that we looked at uh, just now. Let those who suffer to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while continuing to do good. That's, that's what Jesus did. That's what we are also called to. Verse 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you like street, like sh you were straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So notice that Jesus is being presented as, as an example to follow. Right? Uh, is presented as an example of how to bear up under suffering, right? Um, how Jesus didn't retaliate, he didn't take revenge, but he endured it, right? And trusted God as he did so. Right? Um, now, I hope you picked up there that Jesus is being described in language that reminds us of the suffering servant, right? Of Isaiah 53, right? Um, this idea of he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree or by his wounds you have been healed and so on. That's, that's, that's Isaiah 53, isn't it? The suffering servant. Uh, it says there, you know, like verse 6 here, all, uh, let's pick up verse 5. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought his, us peace. With his wounds we are healed. Or we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that's led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shears is silent. So he off opened not his mouth. And so the suffering servant uh, was the one who suffered unjustly, who suffered for the sins of his own people. Right? Uh, and, and Jesus has been presented as a suffering servant. You know, on, on the cross, um, Jesus takes on himself our sins. Um, he suffers God's punishment that we deserve. 
so that we can be healed that is so that we can be forgiven don't misunderstand this that that verse is a very is a favorite one for uh prosperity teachers let's just look at it again and make sure we don't fall into it um into that trap uh so back to 1 peter chapter 2 it says here he himself bore our sins on his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds you have been healed right uh and so look the, the, the prosperity teacher will say look there is healing in the atonement you know no jesus didn't just die for the forgiveness of your sins but he died for the healing of your sicknesses right uh and and, and then they'll, they'll, they'll point you point you back to isaiah 53 where it talks about by his wounds you have been healed it's a favorite passage for prosperity teachers uh but it's one that they have taken out of context because you know, when you when you are reading something from the old testament like like isaiah i mean isaiah didn't just write isaiah 53 you know, there, there are other verses in the book of Isaiah. There's 66 chapters. It's a huge, uh, it's a huge book. Elsewhere in the book, he he he, ex, he expands or he explains what he he means by that that metaphor of sickness and healing. Yes, he's talking about sickness and healing in Isaiah 53, but it's a metaphor, right? Uh, and uh, we can see that if we went back to uh, Isaiah chapter one. Let me just share that. Isaiah chapter one, and Notice how Israel is being described. Let's pick up from verse 4. Our sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly, they've forsaken the Lord, they've despised the Holy One of Israel. They're utterly uh, estranged, right? So God's people are sinful, and God's going to come at them in judgment. But notice how it's described. Notice the metaphor he uses. Uh, and these are exactly the same words that you find in Isaiah 53. Um, why will you still be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick. The whole heart faint from the sole of the foot, even to the head. There is no soundness in it, but bruises and sores and raw wounds. They're not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. You see how the, the metaphor of sickness um, is being used to describe um, their sin, right? Uh, and uh, and the judgment that is coming on them for their sin. Uh, in verse seven, the metaphor is dropped. It just uses literal language, right? What what does it mean that they're head from they're sick from head to toe? Well, your countries lie desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. In your very presence, foreigners devour your land. It's desolate. It's overthrown by foreigners, uh, etc. Et yeah. So, in Isaiah, the language of sickness. It describes sin and, and, and God's judgment on sin, and therefore the language of healing, it describes forgiveness, you see. Um, uh, and we, we can confirm this quite easily as well. Um, uh, the, the New Testament does this for us. So in chapter 6, we find this language of healing again, uh, and uh, this is Isaiah's commissioning, and uh, and God says to Isaiah, look, uh, go and say to this people, keep on hearing, do not understand, keep on seeing, but do not see. May the heart of this people dull, their ears heavy, blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Notice the, the, the same word comes up uh, uh, again here. But it's interesting to note where when you see this verse quoted in the New Testament, um, how is it uh, quoted? So one place you find this quoted is in Mark chapter 4. Uh, and, uh, and you can see it here in verse 12. So that they may indeed see with their see but not perceive, they may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. Now what's going on there? Why, why does Mark, uh, you know, uh, cite the verse as forgiven instead of healed? Well, and you know, did Mark make a mistake? Is that, or did Jesus make a mistake? Did Jesus is his quoting? Did he misquote the Old Testament? Well, no, no, he didn't. He understood the Old Testament. That is, that the healing there, it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor for forgiveness, right? And so when you get to the, the, the suffering servant, it says, by his wounds you are healed. He's not talking about a promise of physical healing in the atonement, right? It's talking about 
forgiveness, right? the healing of sins, right? forgiveness of uh, forgiveness of sins. So uh, we've gone on a bit of a sidetrack there, but the point is that uh, the way that Peter encourages his readers to go through suffering on the way to glory is to look to the example of Jesus. Jesus, the suffering servant, who was godly and innocent, but suffered uh, suffered unjustly and did it for us, of course. He, he suffered for our sins uh, to, to rescue us. Okay, I'm just going to pause there. Would you like to ask any any questions so far about uh, about Peter? Sorry, Reverend, can, can I ask a question? I'm not sure if you're going to cover this later. Mm. Uh, this is in regards to one Peter, uh, chapter four, verse six. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to God. I'm just not quite sure who who Peter's referring to, the dead. Who, who, who's the dead that he's referring to? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a good question and it's quite a difficult <laughs> uh difficult question you've asked there. Uh, there there are quite there are a few passages in in Peter that are uh, uh challenging yeah uh, and and that is certainly certainly one of them. Let me just pull up my notes so I answer that question. Chapter four and verse six, isn't it? Mm. Okay. Uh, let, so let me share the verse so we can all see it together. Chapter four, verse six. Let's just get a bit of context first from verse one. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves in the same way of thinking. Um, this is a similar argument to what we were just saying now. You know, how, does, how does Peter encourage his readers to persevere? He points them to the example of Christ. Since Christ also suffered in the flesh, arm yourself with the same way of thinking. Whoever suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatries. With respect to this, they're surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. Notice there how as you live out your identity as one of God's chosen people, as you live out a holy life, you're holy as God has called you to be holy, uh, uh, holy as God is holy, then you're going to suffer, right? You're, people are going to say, well, why, you know, why aren't you doing what, you know, what we're, what we're doing, right? Uh, they will malign you, verse five, but they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. This is why the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. Right? So I think what Peter means here is that uh, the fact that Christians have had the gospel preached to them uh, doesn't stop them from experiencing physical death. I'll say that again. The fact that Christians have had the gospel preached to them uh, doesn't stop them from experiencing physical death, right? This is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, right? So it's not saying that you go to the, um, it's not saying that you should go to the uh, graveyard and find some dead people and preach the gospel to them. Um, that, that, that that's not the point that the gospel was preached to them when they were alive but now they are dead right um the gospel was preached even to those who, who who are dead or we might say those who are now um those who are now dead um, perhaps uh so let's continue um it says uh that though judged in the flesh the way people are um they might live in the spirit the way god does um so that is, uh, they're judged in the way in the flesh in the way uh, that people are. That is with physical, uh, physical death. Remember, in, in the Garden of Eden, uh, God says, uh, you know, in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. The punishment for sin is death, right? or the wages of sin are death. Romans six twenty three. 
So we know that the punishment for sin is death. We're all sinners and therefore we all die. Right? Um, so they are judged in the flesh uh, the way that uh, that people are right? means that they die. Just because they're Christians doesn't mean that they don't die. All, all Christians will, will face physical death if Jesus doesn't, doesn't return. But ultimately, that's not the end for them. Ultimately, they will... Uh, live in the spirit uh, the way God does. That, that is, for the Christian, death is not the end. Uh, what is the end is, 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 is eternal, yeah, eternal life. So to sum it up, I mean, the point is all people will die, but Christians will live. I mean, Christians will um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll live eternally. And you can see how that uh, it, that's really, this is ex meant to be explaining verse five, right? You know, it just begins with four. Four, this is why the gospel is preached even for those who are dead. So verse five, they, but they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So these these these, these uh, pagan Gentiles who are living in debauchery, well, guess what? They're going to, you know, Jesus is going to return. They're going to face him as the judge. Um, Christians are going to die too, but it's going to be different for the Christian. You know, the Christian is not going to, um, the, the death won't be the ultimate end. They will, they will have life. They will live in the spirit that the way God does. So, I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> that's my attempt to, uh, to explain it, but it is a, it is one of the, the, the more difficult verses in Peter. There is another one too. Um, you can ask about that later if you want to. Uh, Reverend Tim. Yes. Regarding 1 Peter 4, 6. Yep. Uh, yeah, it is definitely a very challenging uh, verse. Can I can I say that uh, on the basis of they might live in the spirit the way God does, uh, so this would refer to Christians that the gospel was preached yes. to them. You see? Um, I mean, who are now dead. Yeah. So, you, well, uh, you see this, the, the language of the, uh, the, the, the spirit comes up quite a number of times in, in, in Peter. And uh, it's going back, again, it's going back to the Old Testament. Right? So it's in the Old Testament, uh, say, for example, in Ezekiel, uh, a good example of this would be, yeah, uh, there's, the, the, there's the promise that um, Ezekiel 36 that in the last days, God will pour out his spirit. Or Joel chapter 2 is another good example. That's the one that Peter quotes at Pentecost, right? In the last days, the spirit will be poured out on all, on all flesh. Uh, so there's, there's certain things, ways that the Old Testament describes the coming kingdom of God. One is the pouring out of the spirit. One is... Um, uh, the idea of the resurrection of the dead, uh, another image is of the, the, the judgment, um, the judgment day, the judgment of um, God's enemies and the salvation of God's, uh, God's people. These are all various ways that are used to describe God's coming kingdom, right? Or what we might call the, the new age, right? Uh, or the age to come. Um, the New Testament uses all these various descriptions. Uh, and we've talked about how the New Testament ultimately talks about the overlap of the ages, right? There's the present age, right, from uh, it starts at creation and ends at uh, Jesus' return. It's the present, present world, often it's called in the New Testament, the present evil age. Um, uh, so, the, you know, that, that's one age, it's the present age, the present evil age, which is going to end when Jesus returns. And then there is the age to come or the age of the kingdom the age of the spirit or the resurrection age call it what you like right it's the same thing uh and and the kingdom is inaugurated through jesus death and resurrection right as he dies to um take the judgment and as he dies well the judgment day begins right and as he's resurrected well the age of resurrection 
um, begins and he, he ascends to heaven and he's seated on the throne of heaven. So the reign of the Messiah begins. Uh, he pours out his spirit. The age of the spirit begins. He says, the, the, the kingdom is inaugurated with the death and resurrection of Jesus and it will go on into eternity so that right now we live in the overlap of the ages we still belong into this present evil age but uh, if we're Christians then we also belong to the age to come right uh, we've received the spirit we've received spiritual resurrection we're living under the, the rule of uh, Messiah Jesus uh, etc we're in the overlap of the ages which the New Testament calls the last days pretty sure we've talked about this in the previous uh, previous courses right so so that's so when you see the language of uh, of here they're judged in the flesh the way people are right? so in the present evil age sin the judgment for sin is death right but they might live in the spirit the way god does that is um you know the spirit is bringing the you know the new life of the kingdom in, in eternal in eternal life to them that's the that that's what's being said here so yes the christian will still die just like other people but on the final judgment we, we will live right whereas the pagan gentile who's living in all kinds of debauchery they're going to meet jesus as the as the judge they're not going to live eternally in the spirit they're going to they're going to be contemned for uh, uh, contempt for eternity uh in 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 hell so that's so when if you see this kind of language of the spirit coming up in peter um uh that's what you've got to keep in mind i hope that makes sense i didn't confuse you too much <laughs> yeah it's a very a, a tough one that one it's a tough one. Mm. Pro probably we'll yeah thanks 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 for the explanation i i can't say i fully understand uh that that would definitely not be true uh but is something that we we'll need to look further into, you know, read up commentaries or I'm sure there'll be a lot of write up on it. Uh, there's, there's a lot. This uh, is what, what, what we're talking about here is is uh, is eschatology, right? Or the um, the end times. I mean, when we talk about the end times, we're not just talking about oh, you know, is there an antichrist? Is there a thousand years millennium mm -hmm. reign? All these things. I mean, um, <laughs> there's there's certain people that are obsessed with that. Uh, with that kind of thing and yes we do need to have a view on those things right but eschatology broadly speaking is talking about the end times right and as i said the old testament talks about what would happen at the end or in the last days and last days would be resurrection it would be pouring out of the spirit the reign of the messiah uh the judgment of god's enemies and the salvation of god's people that's that but okay i'm, I'm just i'm just it. wondering mm. i'm just wondering whether like the sentence as it is translated is it a translation issue in a no. sense that it's not uh, a translation the, issue. no i mean the, the greek and the words used could be like it could be interpreted in quite a number of ways I don't um, think so this is one no. of the, i mean some you're right you're right to say that sometimes uh you know reading greek think some things become clearer yeah. sometimes you're reading greek some things become more complicated um uh because the translation the english translation has simplified it but in this case uh whether you read it in greek or english it's the same it's it, i it's, see um, it's not I a see. translation won't help you yeah okay so it's not a translation issue. it's not a translation issue okay okay so then then it it is what it is and so I think a lot uh, of people, Christians or non-Christians, who read, like preach even to those who are dead, just taking that that clause uh, is like, whoops, what uh, what do we have here, you know? Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> so that's, that's why I mean, because we, we don't know Greek, so we're just wondering whether, it, you know, uh, because let's say like, the little Hebrew that we know through our Hebrew class is just that uh, certain words can mean so many things and be translated uh, into English and so many English words can be used for a particular Hebrew word. So now it's just about the context in which the word is used 
So I was just wondering whether that is happening here. You know? So I suppose in all the different um, version of English, this is ESV, uh, KJV or, or NIV will, will translate it in the same way. Uh, yeah, they'll be they'll be quite similar. I mean, why don't we look at the NIV? You can see, you can see that. No, um, okay, okay. Yeah, so it's it's, it's a tough one, this one. Hmm. Uh, and and you'll see how the NIV here is kind of bringing out the translation that I mean the explanation that I just okay. gave you. This is the reason the gospel is preached even to those who are now dead. Oh, right? now, you won't find the word now. The, the word now is not in the is not in the Greek, um, uh, which is why it's missing from the ESV, right? But the NIV is trying to draw out what the Greek means right? or what it's meant by, you know, preached to those who are now dead so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit, right? Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, uh, because it's a dynamic translation, not a literal translation, um, you can see, I mean, this is this is the advantage of uh, reading dynamic translations because they, they, they aid your understanding. They help to clarify mm. uh, uh, things, things for you. But I mean, as Bible college students, I think it's good to be reading um, more literal translations if possible. So you can in, engage more closely with the, you know, with the Greek text that lies behind it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think I understand it now. Thank you. All right. Well, Thank that's you. That, that's great. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, it, it is a, it is a difficult one. Any other questions you want to ask? Uh, Reverend David, just could that same passage have anything to do with Matthew twenty seven fifty two from the uh the graves that were opened, the dead that came uh, back to life when Jesus died? Uh, I I I. I don't think so. Um, yeah, I, I think what's, I mean, Matt, that's, that passage is unique in Matthew's, Matthew's gospel. It's only Matthew that mentions yeah. that graves open and, and yeah. people come out. But I, I think, I, I guess the, why is Matthew including that? He's showing that, well, the, the death of Jesus conquers death, basically. Yeah. Um, and it, it's, uh, it, it's interesting. It says that the, the bodies of many people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. So it's um, so it's, it's the death and the resurrection of Jesus. So it's the death of uh, the death of Jesus uh, ultimately defeats sin, right? and the resurrection of Jesus conquers death. Uh, yeah, conquers death, and that is pictured with these with these people coming out of their graves but i take it they're not they're going to die again it's more like a resuscitation like lazarus rather than a, it's not an end it's not it's not a resurrection like jesus one is like never to die again or something like um like that but it's a yeah like 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 lazarus it's a it's a it's a picture of uh, you know a very visible or graphic picture of uh, what the death and resurrection of jesus has um, has, has achieved yeah but i don't think you can use that as a uh, interpretive key for Peter. I think it's different. Okay, thanks. Okay, now time is uh, getting away a little bit. Let's let's at least look at the structure, and then we can uh, uh, we can do our exegetical task and and then take a break. Okay, so let me share my screen here. And just show you a couple of ways, different ways that people have tried to uh, structure the book. So we've got, uh, so this is Shrinan, it's the ESV Study Bible. This is Grudem, the Tyndale Commentary. Jobs is the Baker Commentary. And Clowney is the uh, Bible Speaks Today Commentary. Now, as you look at those, you see that they're actually uh, very similar in lots of ways, right? So you've got, uh, you know, the opening, um, you know, the opening salutation and address. Um, Peter introduces himself and his audience, addresses his audience. Uh, then you've got the first main section here. And 
I mean, I think uh, you can see here Clowney doesn't really break it down into macro sections like the rest, but they, all, all of them agree here. You've got one, one, three to two, ten, one, three to two, ten, one, three to two, ten. So that's the first main section of the letter. Then you've got two eleven to five eleven, uh, and they're all basically in agreement there. Although Jobs has 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 divided that um, in 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 half, uh, and then you've got the final um, the final greeting there. Uh, in other words. Uh, there is uh, these basically this there's, there's two main uh, two main sections to the letter or perhaps uh, if you follow jobs here there's three uh, three main sections uh, to uh, to the letter uh, and you could almost think about it as past present and future in some ways right so here uh, uh, God has saved us to be God's people in the past, right? I'm referring here. God, we've been saved to be God's people in the past. Um, and so that means that we suffer as sojourners in the present, but we're ultimately headed to uh, to, to glory uh, in, in the future. So past, present, uh, future. I think that's a a really nice way of, of, of dividing out the letter. Let's just see that in the text itself. So we begin uh, with the opening readings there, Peter and Apostle to God's elect exiles. Let's go back to the ESV. Uh, to, the, uh, to the elect exiles. Uh, grace and peace, right? Then we've got the first part here. Uh, and Again, it's about how 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 God has uh, brought us into this uh, into this hope, this hope of of, of glory. Um, this is the salvation that the Old Testament prophets were uh, were were looking uh, were looking forward to, um, and and therefore uh, we are to uh, to be holy um, uh, as as God is holy, uh, because we have been redeemed. And I hope you I hope you pick up here the. Uh, how, again, it's picking up lots of Old Testament imagery. Right? It says here that we were uh, ransomed from the futile ways inherited from our far forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Right? So you think back Old Testament, what's that referring to? Well, maybe the Exodus. Right? Um, the Passover, right? uh, when God redeemed his people out of Egypt. Notice it's using that same language there, the language of ransomed or redeemed. It's That, that, that takes us back to the Exodus. Um, how did God redeem or ransom his people out of Egypt? Well, through the blood of the, of the lamb, right? Uh, the Passover lamb had to be unblemished, right? It had to be one-year-old male lamb. Without without a blemish or spot, and then it was killed. The, the the blood was painted on the doorposts, and and then the angel of death would would pass over, and they'd be they they were rescued. And then they, you know, that very night they they left Egypt, went through the Red Sea, and um and, and over to Mount Sinai. And then while they were at Mount Sinai, that's where God gave them His law, uh, including this passage that is being quoted here from Leviticus: "Be holy, or you shall be holy." Uh, for I am uh, holy, Leviticus eleven forty four, or perhaps chapter nineteen, verse uh, verse two. So you're redeemed by the the blood of the Lamb, but you're redeemed for the purpose of being God's holy people. You see, uh, we saw something very similar just now in Exodus chapter nineteen. Right? Uh, you've seen you yourselves have seen what I did. How I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. So you've been redeemed. Therefore, uh, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession. So you've been redeemed, but you've been redeemed for the purpose of being God's holy special people. And you can see the same thing is being um, now being said about the church, uh, but it's you know taken on to a, a higher key, like the fulfillment. In Jesus, we've been saved not through the blood of the Passover lamb. We've been saved by the blood of Jesus, right? the perfect, um, perfect blood. Uh, and we've been ransomed uh, so that we we live holy lives 
while we uh, continue to journey to our to our promised land, right to our to our heavenly to our heavenly home. So there's this call for uh, yeah for um, for holy living, uh, loving one another, uh, etc. And you know, yeah, craving craving for God's word, growing up in God's word, uh, and and then, it, and then in verses 4 to 10, uh, we're described as the new temple, right? Uh, so verse 4, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So, uh, of course, God's Old Testament people, they had a temple, right? And they had priests right and they had sacrifices and so on um but now this is fulfilled by the church right i don't mean church in terms of the church building church building is not a temple uh, the pastors of the church are not priests i don't mean in that in that way we are the temple god, all of god's people are god's temple you and i are the stones in the temple uh, you, we are the holy priesthood. You know, we are as God's people. We are to be the kingdom of priests who proclaims God's excellencies to the world. We are to offer spiritual sacrifices. I, 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 that's I, I take it that's our gospel proclamation. So we as we make um, you know a sacrifice of praise, as the Book of Hebrews would would, would put it. Uh, and so that that that's who we are. We are God's new worshiping community. We've been saved to be His His, his people. So. And then that's all past, right? That that's all the things that God has done for us in the past, right? And uh, then uh, we see this word "beloved" here, and, and in one Peter, this often marks the beginning of a new new section. Right? So, beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh. So, if he's established that this is our identity, you know, we are God, we are God's elect exiles, his new worshiping community, etc then now he's moving on to how we should live as God's holy people in this world while we wait for the world to come, right? Uh, and, and what are we to do? He says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. That is, we are to bear witness through uh, our holy lives uh, to uh, the non-Christian world uh, around us. And then he gives us very, very examples of this in the following verses. And the thing that is in common here is the idea of being being subject. So he says, uh, be subject to every human institution, whether the emperor is supreme. So it's talking about governments, kings, various authorities. Uh, it's very striking, isn't it? Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. And it's not going to be long after this that Emperor Nero is throwing the Christians to be eaten by the lions. Um, but here Peter says, honor the emperor, right? be subject to the emperor. And so the fact that we, uh, you know, that, that the Christian finds themselves under an unjust government does not mean that they should not honor them or uh, respect them or obey them. You know, very challenging words for us. Uh, then he moves. He moves to the, to the uh, servants uh, or slaves. Slaves, be subject to your masters. Again, notice with all respect, doing good, enduring unjust suffering, right? looking to the example of Jesus, the servant. Then he turns to wives. Wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct um, of, of of their wives. So. Uh, He's talking about the present. How how are, we, how are Christians to live in a pagan world around them? Right? They are to live honourable lives, which means being submissive. It means being uh, respectful, um, and therefore adorning the gospel. And um, we see this in how we relate to authorities. We see it how we relate to employers. We see it how we relate to um, uh, our husbands, um, uh, and, and so on. Right. Uh, and and then he he continues on with this uh, with this uh, theme of, of of godly godly living. Right? Uh, uh, finally, have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, tender heart, humble mind. Don't repay evil for evil, but on the contrary, bless. To this you were called that you may obtain 
a, a blessing. So it, it's pushing towards doing good, uh, being a, a blessing to others, even if you are going to, uh, to, to suffer for it. And again, Jesus' example is held up as the model. Christ also suffered for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Notice how that, uh, we, we, it's a very similar phrase to the one we just talked about in chapter 4. Uh, and in, in verse uh, six, right? So he his body died, um, but he was made alive in the spirit. That is, uh, um, by the spirit in, into the you know into the new age, right? Um, the resurrection age. Uh, and then there's the other difficult verses that you haven't asked me about yet. Uh, and then verses uh, four, uh, four, one to ten. Uh, you know, uh, don't. Don't follow the Gentiles with all their, you know, all their lawless wickedness. You are to be different because God's going to call you to account. Um, and so this is what this is what you should do, right? And and the section clearly ends here with uh, verse eleven: "To Him be the glory and dominion forever and ever." Amen. The doxology marks the end of the section. The new section then begins uh, with the word "beloved," uh, showing that we're now in the third uh, major section, and it's really now we're really looking forward to the future, right? Don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, right? So this is something in the future. It hasn't happened yet, but don't be surprised by it as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also uh, be glad when his glory is revealed, right? So uh, they are to expect more severe suffering to come, right? Uh, suffering for being a Christian, but it is suffering that ultimately leads to glory. So continue to suffer according to God's will, looking to glory. Uh, he addresses the leaders of the church. There's a final, you know, some final pleas here in verses 6 to uh, six to 11. Again, suffering now, glory later, and then his final purpose statement. This is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. Suffering now, glory later. You live a holy life, as God's redeemed people, his new worshipping community, you will suffer for it. Don't, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised when difficulties come in your Christian life. They will come. Yeah. It's normal Christianity to suffer. So don't, don't be surprised. That's the true grace of God because suffering now leads to glory, uh, glory to come. All right, so there's a, it's a brief uh, overview of 1 Peter. There's so much more that could be said, of course, but uh, we are well and truly out of time here. Let's, uh, let's take a break. Let's take a five minutes uh, break. When we come back, we, we will do our exegetical on, on 1 Peter, okay? So enjoy your break. I'll see you in five minutes or so. Okay, so I've been asked, well, what's Peter talking about in chapter 3, verses 18? Uh, and 19, 18 and following. And uh, you may know that this is some of the most difficult verses in the Bible. Um, there have been countless PhDs and, and, and so on. Every, most commentaries that you read will, you know, give you a different take on it, which is different to all the others and, and so on. So uh, let me just say that by way of qualification, that whatever I say here, you've got to take it very tentatively and i could very well be wrong and um and 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 so on right so I'll, but let me just share what i what i think and then you can go from there uh so verse 18 uh, so he's just talked verse 17 introduces it's better to suffer for doing good if that be god's will uh then uh to suffer for evil for now this is now explaining his statement Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. So that is the ultimate example of suffering for good, isn't it? Jesus suffers for our for our good. Uh, he dies for the, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring us to God, you know, as the, as the servant and so on. Being put to death in the flesh, uh, but, uh, but made alive uh, in, uh, in the spirit. Right. Uh, and the point really that follows from that in verses 19 to 22 uh, is that Jesus has been raised victorious overall right so he suffers for good but then he's glorified 
uh, and and victorious, right? So suffering and then glory. That's the basic point, even though they are very, very difficult verses, right? So we continue, in which uh, he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who's going to heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. So the first question you must ask there then is who are the spirits in prison? And uh, it's very likely that they are disobedient angels, right? Uh, the same disobedient angels that are mentioned in 2 Peter and also in Jude, right? So 2 Peter verse 4 says this. Uh, two, sorry, 2 Peter 2 verse 4. Uh, he says, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness, to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness. Notice the, the mention of Noah again in this verse as well. So there we have uh, angels who sinned and were and, and were put into chains of gloomy darkness, waiting for the final judgment. Right? Uh, Jude writes something similar. Jude six. Uh, he says, and the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Now, so the, the question then is who are, uh, you know, the spirits in prison or who are these uh, angels in uh, chains of gloomy, uh, chains of gloomy darkness, etc. I think the most likely explanation of that is it's going back to Genesis, right? Um, and the Nephilim, right? Remember in uh, Genesis chapter six, uh, we are told there that the uh, that the sons of God came into the daughters of men and bore children to them, and these children were the um, were the ne were the Nephilim, um, who were the um, you know who were the the giants and and, and so on. Uh, so you might know that this term sons of God, it, it can be sometimes used in the Bible to talk about angels. And so um, uh, the idea is that these, these angels, they crossed from their proper bounds by somehow having a relationship with human beings, human women, um, uh, that, that bore the Nephilim, that bore these, 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 these giants, um, whoever they were. Yeah. Uh, so that seems to be what is being referred to and of course in genesis itself this happens just before the flood so this is something that god considers so evil that he ends up you know you know wiping out the whole world except for noah uh to to start again and it also explains why one and two peter straight after talking about the, these uh spirits in prison or these angels in gloomy darkness it goes on to talk about uh noah right uh so yeah so on the one hand, uh, uh, God uh, God is the God who judges the wicked, and in that sense, the these spirits in prison. If Jesus is the if Jesus is the ultimate example of suffering for doing good, then the then these angels are the ultimate example for suffering for doing evil. Right? They suffer for doing evil. The result is. Um, chains of gloomy darkness and final judgment right jesus suffering for doing good the result is uh, he will be uh, raised you know raised raised victorious in in, in glory right so uh he so this uh, saving of the righteous uh he, he is is picked up with with noah uh so we have judgment on we have uh, the judgment on the world but we have the salvation of of Noah, this 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 happens through uh, through water. So what happens with Noah being saved, you know, through the waters of the flood in the boat? It's this this uh, foreshadows or anticipates the way that Christians are saved through the waters of of baptism. So it says baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. But uh, as he quickly clarifies here, um, he doesn't mean that baptism itself saves you, as if. Uh, um, you know, you can just uh, pick up some random person off the street and 
bring them into a church and baptize them and and, and then they're saved even though they never go to church again they never read the bible they never have no faith in jesus whatever that's, that's not the point here right uh, he's not saying that baptism the, the the act of baptism saves you but he's, he's talking about what the baptism signifies right so not as a removal of dirt from the body but as an appeal to god for a a, a good conscience that is the act of baptism signifies the trusting in the death and, and resurrection of Jesus, and it's the resurrected Jesus who has who has been exalted uh, to the right hand of God uh, in uh, oh, oh, yeah over overall. Over okay? So uh, if you put that all together, right, it's better to suffer for doing good, like Jesus, than to suffer for doing evil. Okay? Jesus suffered for doing good; he was exalted to the right hand of God. Noah suffered also, um, but was saved through the waters of the flood. But the angels who suffered for doing evil, um, and those in Noah's day who suffered for doing evil, um, were, were destroyed. And so it's better to suffer for doing good than it is to suffer for doing good. That's the point. I think, yeah, that, that's how I would, uh, how I would understand um, the verses. <laughs> <laughs> so any questions of course you've got questions so <laughs> uh yeah you can think about that but there might be other explanations that are better yeah.